Hey everyone, Coretta here. Still working out all the kinks of this. It is so cool. Uh, super excited to be here tonight with my guest, Ben Matolo from, am I saying it right, Ben Matolo? Ben Matolo, yep. Okay. Uh, Chittenden. Chittenden 3, Jericho and Chittenden. Chittenden 3, Jericho and Underhill. So he's running for house rep. Mm -hmm. Met at his uh, a meet and greet of yours. Yep. A couple weeks ago. Uh, last weekend. Last weekend. Uh, I was just super excited to meet Ben. Um, I tell people all the time that when I go to, oh, oh, hello, Catherine. Hi, hi. Um, I tell people all the time when I go to any sort of Republican event or conservative event, uh, I'm normally the youngest person by 20 years. And so now there's someone who's 20 years, my junior. So I'm not the youngest person anymore. Uh, ben, you are 20? I'm 20. Yep. You are 20. Hello, Alice. Uh, and you are, uh, college student. I am. I'm a junior in college and I okay. go to uh, a school called SUNY ESF, uh, which stands for Environmental Science and Forestry, and it's in upstate New York and Syracuse. Oh, oh, interesting. So would you normally be at school right now? Or yeah, Well, I'm actually, I'm at campus right now, um, but I'm distance learning while on campus for some of my classes. So it's just an odd sort of motley crew of COVID policies coming at me right now. Got it. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. I have so many questions. Okay, so you said it's SUNY ESF? Yep. Environmental Studies and Forestry? Yep. And so what are you studying there? Uh, I'm an undergraduate in policy and law, so environmental policy and law. Environmental policy and law. Okay. <clears throat> and what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, well, in the near future, I hope to be my district's house representative. House rep. Okay, that was the obvious answer. Okay, I should have got, I totally should have gotten that one. <laughs> um, but in the future, I'd really love to be uh, an environmental attorney working to protect uh, our shared spaces from those who want to do them harm. Um, classic Lorax kind of character is what I'm going for. I love it. Mm -hmm. I think that is so cool. Is there anything in particular that you have an interest in or what? What sort of sparked your interest to study that? Anything in particular? Well, probably growing up in the most beautiful state in the lower 48. Um, you know, I spent my entire life in Underhill, grew up hunting, fishing, camping, skiing. I was an Eagle Scout in high school. And so my entire life basically took place outside. Um, and so, you know, I've got a very strong connection with, uh, with, our, with our shared planet. And so, you know, it was just sort of a natural gravitation toward, um, you know, studying environmental policy. I love that. Hi, Karen. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have found it very interesting recently. Do you know very much about Teddy Roosevelt? Yep. He was uh, a great Republican president. He started the national park system. So this, I didn't really know a lot about Teddy Roosevelt until recently. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, he started the park system and didn't he set aside some huge amount of many multiple huge land swaths of and land. stuff like that? Yep, many multiple huge swaths of land and he started the US Forest Service as well. Um, so he was like a pioneer in conservation because at that time America was so focused on tearing down every tree in sight. I mean, look at pictures of Vermont from turn of the century. Um, the industrial know, revolution. Not a tree to be found. So yeah, he basically started started or was it you know set the precedent for American conservation in the 20th century. That is so fascinating. So then oh okay so I'm just I'm I'm my my brain is going a million miles a minute with this because I think it's really interesting particularly because you mentioned that he it was a Republican president. Yeah. And uh one of the things that you know, the, the whole point of this conversation today is debunking the myth that conservatives don't care about the environment. Right. And, you know, this idea that somehow we don't also want to make sure we're preserving um, our green spaces and how, like, the, how beautiful Vermont is. Um, 
do you, you don't, I know this is probably a crazy question. You don't have any pictures of Vermont from the turn of the century, like handy, do you? I do not. I'm sorry. Oh, I want to Google it now because I had heard at one point that, and I don't know if any of this is true. Basically, I heard that they cut down all the trees in Vermont to make uh, telephone poles for New York City. Yeah. And basically shot every single game species to feed New York City as well. Um, this state was devoid of game species for a very long time um, because of overhunting um, and commercial hunting and fishing. And uh, only through like really concerted restoration efforts in the past 75 years have we been able to uh, reconstitute the state's population of game species. That is so interesting. Now, I remember we didn't have moose when I was growing up as an again. So I'm 42. I remember when they started having moose sightings again in Vermont and it was a really big deal. And I've heard rumors that there have been mountain lion catamount sightings. Do you know if that's true or not? Uh, I, I cannot confirm, but I hope with my entire heart that that is true. Um, you know, you can think about the environment as like a system designed by an engineer, right? It's like a car engine. It needs all its components to function properly. And so if you're missing a head gasket, your engine's not gonna work. And if you're missing an apex predator, um, your ecosystem isn't gonna function properly either. And so the return of these um, meta mammals, these giant predators um, mean big things for Vermont. And I, I'm very excited about, it. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, Karen said there was a moose in Montpelier when I lived there a few years ago, like right in town, mm -hmm. Did come right into town. I'm curious. Now, it's interesting when you talk about when you say apex predator, because that means if we don't have those predators, then the, you know, like deer population becomes overrun or other animal species. And that to me is one of the roles of hunting and fishing and sportsmen's clubs and things like that is yeah. how do we manage and be good stewards of the wildlife that we have here? Well, that's so a couple interesting points in there. Um, so one, if we did get rid of what's, this happened out West um, as people were moving West when, you know, as we were talking about Teddy Roosevelt was setting aside huge swaths of land out West. Um, a gentleman named Aldo Leopold, who grew up to be, you know, one of the icons of forest management, to say the least, um, was managing a piece of property out west in Montana. And he thought that if he eradicated the gray wolf population, the deer population would explode and he would create a hunter's paradise. But what ended up happening was, you know, people were moving out west and shooting all these wolves by the hundreds. The deer and elk population exploded. They devoured all the vegetation on all those mountainsides that had sustained them until there was nothing left. And then the deer and elk population collapsed. And so that was flawed logic. He didn't see the <laughs> effectiveness of the system. Um, and so just as people might think that, you know, if I get rid of hunting and fishing opportunities, wouldn't that preserve the wildlife? Actually, it wouldn't because the reason that these wildlife populations have been able to be restored is that every time you buy hunting and fishing gear, you pay an invisible tax that goes into a fund that the state has specifically set aside for restoration and conservation efforts. And so hunters and fisher folk are actually responsible for the bulk of conservation in the United States. Um, and also, you know, not, not in least included Vermont. Um, and I so did are, not and, know oh, that. Yeah. And so that's actually a market-based solution to conservation. So the command and control solution would be to put a moratorium on hunting certain species, you know, setting game limits, and those are all well and good. But to truly preserve a species, we need a sustainable fund of money. Um, and that can't just come through burdensome tax like income tax because not everybody hunts. And so that doesn't seem fair to make people pay for things that they're not going to use. But hunters and fishermen have a vested interest in keeping these sports alive. And so that's why every time I go to the Dick's Sporting Goods in Williston to buy new fishing gear, it's a little bit extra because I'm paying for trout um, habitat restoration. I'm paying for deer sampling. I'm paying for bear molar restoration. I'm paying for all those things. That is so fascinating. And Ben, thank you for really taking the time to point out the difference, right? So when we say debunking the myth that conservatives don't care about the environment, 
just pointed out a market-based solution that better facilitates the preservation and health of our wildlife here in Vermont. Yeah, um, and, and I can speak to that point um, a little further if I get too geeky, just, uh, just stop me, but- No, I love every, it. Every single piece of historic landmark environmental legislation up to this point has been passed under a Republican president and a bipartisan Congress. So the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act in 1970 were passed under Richard Nixon, who also started the Environmental Protection Agency. He's a Republican. And along with the Endangered Species Act, three pieces of legislation which are still being used today to set precedents for air um, pollution reductions goals and water pollution reduction, Republican president. Um, the reason that we still have forests in the Northeast is because George Herbert Walker Bush instituted a cap and trade initiative um, to amend the Clean Air Act in 1990, um, which is another market-based solution because all these coal-fired power plants in the Midwest were spewing ash into the sky. It would travel east. It would rain down onto the Adirondacks and us, and that yep. rain would be slightly acidic, and it would destroy our forests. Yep. There was no real way to control interstate pollution um, until George Herbert Walker Bush used the power of the presidency to push for a market-based solution to reduce emissions causing acid rain. And um, that same market-based solution, cap and trade, um, which is a very complicated systems of issuing polluter permits and essentially monetizing right. to save money to <laughs> pet pollution. Um, that same method of emissions reductions was actually being recommended by conservatives as a means to fight climate change at the national level. Um, but without him, without Kurt George H.W. Bush, our northern forests would be destroyed. Um, and okay, then hold on. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, hold on. Okay, hold on. Hold on to that for one second. So let's, oh, Karen says, yes, the moose was walking down Main Street. Um, Mo, uh, they once said timber wolves were going to come back. Catamounts are, catamounts are around, but they don't want anyone hunting them. So they're hiding. Is that what you're saying? They're hiding. Um, so when you, and I, so I am just learning all of this, everyone. This is fascinating and super fun for me because I don't know everything. I know, I know it seems like I do because I'm so brilliant, but well, I'm off as kind of a genius. <laughs> so what is, can you talk at all about the difference between like a, when we say cap and trade versus um, carbon tax, mm -hmm. they almost sort of sound the same, right? Like carbon, you know, are we, if we're trying to do something to manage mm -hmm. uh, the way we pollute and we're monetizing it, right? What's the difference? Uh, well, so both of them are actually um, conservative solutions to emissions. Um, right. uh, there's actually a bill on the House floor right now called it's HR seven six three. This is on this is in Congress. This isn't in um, Vermont local politics. Okay. Um, but it's a carbon fee and dividend. And essentially, what that is is it's carbon price um, or carbon tax. I instead of saying carbon tax. I, I like to say carbon price because tax sort of sounds like something that the government is arbitrarily choosing that doesn't want. And a mm -hmm. price is something that you have to pay for moral, it's a moral obligation to pay the price for something. And the reason that I like to make that distinction is because we don't just arbitrarily want less carbon in the atmosphere. It's a carbon price because somebody is paying for those emissions. Right now it's us because we will bear the brunt of the effects of climate change and our taxes are gonna go up to fuel climate adaptations, building seawalls, restoring ecosystems, things like that. When it should be the first polluting, it should research be the first development. to responsibility to pay for that. So they're paying the carbon price. Um, and cap and trade is essentially, you're gonna issue a bunch of permits to pollute that allow you to pollute. And you allow companies to trade them amongst themselves so that the companies with higher marginal costs, meaning that companies who would pay more for each for each level of pollution, could get away with polluting more, while larger companies who could afford to reduce emissions can do so. And then you reduce the number of permits issued every single year until emissions have reduced to below acceptable levels, things that the natural world can absorb. This is so fascinating. Um, but so yeah, okay. both of them are market-based, um, con conservative in principle, um, policies to reduce emissions. 
So what do you think then about the carbon tax that they're doing in Vermont, where they're going to have an extra tax on like home heating oil? I, you know, I, I really do want our country to act on climate, but we just can't seem to get it together to do it the right way. And there's a lot of things <laughs> wrong with this. Now, I've got some serious criticisms with state level pollution reduction schemes for a multitude of reasons. One, because carbon emissions are economy wide. You can't just single out home and heating or transportation or energy or food production and then arbitrarily make them lower their emissions while the rest of these industries continue to pollute. And unfortunately, when regulations come down from federal or state agencies, they're industry specific. So you can't just say, I'm going to reduce carbon. As you mentioned, it's gonna be a carbon tax on home and heating or a gas tax. And one of the most deceiving parts about that is scale, right? As yeah. I mentioned earlier, air pollution knows no boundaries. And so if the scale isn't correct, our state could see emissions reductions, but global emissions would stay the same because businesses are either evacuating Vermont or people are making different choices on who to patronize based on the carbon tax. And well, so- and that's one of the things or, that I've, one of the things I've been so confused about is how there's this huge push for solar, huge push for solar here in Vermont. And on the surface, it sounds like a good idea. So right, when you talk about we're offsetting pollution or whatever, See, paying the price for pollution or firms are paying the price for pollution. Right. And if we, as an example, and what, what, who pays on that carbon tax, right? So mm -hmm. if we were to say, we're going to tax to the level that carbon is used in the production of something. Yeah. So then solar panels would have a huge carbon tax because they take more fossil fuels to create and then ship here overseas, assemble and all that stuff, then they save. Plus you have the slave labor in Africa, the toxic pollution of the batteries. So that's a cost. So that's, I get so confused sometimes. I go, okay, solar panels sound good, but there's this huge cost to them. It doesn't really sound like a better option. And so if all you're going to do is tax things that look like fossil fuels on the surface, but not fossil fuels used to create something, then what is it actually helping in a state that's winter nine months out of the year? Yeah, and the, I mean, the answer to that is it's not. Um, the state can't possibly plan our energy mix effectively. And the other thing about that, the carbon tax, it's such a, it's a really interesting policy and it's one that I love to geek out about because it's really elegant at reducing emissions if designed correctly. So the way that our state has designed it, it's actually incredibly regressive. A conservative, mm -hmm. From a conservative standpoint, if a firm chooses to, you can't throw your garbage into my backyard for free and not pay for it, right? If you want <laughs> garbage in my backyard, you should have to pay the price. You can't throw carbon up into our shared atmosphere without paying for it. So firms should pay the carbon tax. But what, what's happening, what would happen if Vermont instituted a statewide carbon tax is we'd be paying for it because companies would immediately pass down those costs onto the consumer and we would lose out. This is exactly what happened in France when Emmanuel Macron tried to pass a gas tax, people rallied against it. That's what those yellow jacket protests were about. Oh, yep. it immediately got passed on to the protesters who were already heavily taxed. They, France is one of the most aggressive tax schemes in all of Europe. And so this idea, so, yeah, sorry. Well, go, go so ahead. hold on. No, we're just, we're getting some questions. So Karen, first she said, um, she's, oh, what you explained something better than her land use law professor did. That's what she said. It was a little while ago. Right. Um, Thank you very much. And then when Karen, when you say, so don't they get subsidies? What do you mean by that exactly? And, and actually I have a major problem with the subsidies. Yeah, personally, because to me, if the only people that I'm aware of that can afford the install and maintenance of solar panels are people of a higher income bracket. And so yeah. the state of Vermont is taxing lower and middle class people 
in a wealth transfer to rich people. Yep. Pete, a lot of a lot of Vermonters don't know that Social Security is taxed. So if you're a retired person and you're earning Social Security, it's taxed like it's income. So your grandma is getting her Social Security taxed so that we can install solar panels on a rich person's house. It's it's really silly. One of the one of the real benefits of having a carbon price is it lets the market market is a fancy term for people. We let we can. Can we all agree that we can choose the best energy mix for our state? We can't just step in and say it's all going to be wind and solar. And that's ridiculous. There's a cadre of green energy sources that we can use. And to just have the government step in and say, we're going to subsidize green energy or we're going to push wind and solar. It's, it's ridiculous. Because as you said before, I mean, there's the amount of fossil fuels it takes to generate a solar cell is ridiculous. And, you know, I don't want to, with all due respect to, to House um, Democrats in Congress, one of my biggest criticisms about the Green New Deal, among many, because I, I don't really believe that it's an effective means by any stretch of the imagination of fighting climate change, is it doesn't include nuclear. And that's why I truly believe that it's really just about pushing wind and solar across the nation, no matter the cost or no matter how in Congress or inconvenient it might just be it, like if we just put enough money oh, in no way though way though no wait okay I'm gonna no wait okay I'm gonna argue with you on this one and yeah. I'm gonna let you try to convince me are you ready I'm on it okay I've heard so many conservatives say that a similar talking point to that mm -hmm. um that if you're not about nuclear then you're not really about whatever and I go, no, nuclear is to toxic, poisonous waste that we have, we have decades of nuclear waste that we still don't have a place mm -hmm. to dispose of it. So I, that can't be an answer. Well, it's not the answer. The, uh, it would be just as wrong to say we're going to subsidize solar to the nth degree and have that spread across the country. But well, um, I agree it, it'd be just as wrong, sorry, if, excuse me. It'd be just as wrong to say we're gonna subsidize nuclear and push that across the country. And yes, those are valid exactly. concerns about the waste, but that's from um, fission, right? There's another way of deriving energy from atoms and it's called fusion. And that technology is still on the horizon, but what it does is it generates a fraction of the waste and it allows the atoms to perform at a higher level of energy output um, so we could actually get more bang for our buck without generating the same amount of waste. And that what? Technology, yeah, that technology is still on the horizon, but because they can't compete on a level playing field with um, natural gas. We're putting coal, all our money really, into solar panels and wind exactly. turbines. They can't, it's not a level playing field. And so we'll never really know what the possibilities with fusion nuclear are because mm nobody is being incentivized to innovate. And so that's one of the that's one of the things. There's a lot of really cool answers to these questions about our energy mix that could be found if the energy market was a level playing field. Yeah, if oh, see market, market solutions, competition, choice. Yep. So one you know, people should asked, compete for uh, oh, what's that? Sorry, I said the solution works because entrepreneurs will compete to find the most efficient ways to they want to make money. Yeah, I I have a friend. Okay, and I can Ray. I I see your question. I'm gonna ask. I have a friend who's like a rocket scientist or whatever, and he invented some device that you install on a natural gas burning power plant, and it basic. And I'm gonna. I'm totally getting it wrong. And I've tried to talk about it. I need to ask him to refresh me. It basically like captures the, um the waste or the carb, whatever emissions and uses it to like keep the plant running. And it, it cuts the pollution down to almost nothing. And natural gas is cheap. Yep. It's so cheap. And we don't have to depend on other places, but we can't even have that conversation. We would rather freaking burn wood chips in the McNeil power plant and not actually be able to make enough power. We don't actually need to be zero emissions. We need to be net zero emissions. Um, nature, the car, there's a carbon cycle on Earth, right? It cycles. Um, plants take it up during photosynthesis. That's how they make their food. We breathe it out as we breathe because we breathe in the oxygen that plants produce. 
and then the cycle continues. Nature has ways of sinking or sequestering CO2 back into the ground. That's why our forests are so important because they take CO2 literally from the air. And so this idea that we can't emit any carbon at any time, it's, it's just not true. We need to be net zero. So we can't be overloading the system. Right. Um, we can like we were we back can. in the day when we were just blasting coal power plants and, and leveling all, all the trees. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Ray asked, why doesn't the state promote geothermal? I don't actually know what that is. So geothermal, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is tapping into the heat deep beneath the Earth's crust um, to warm up to basically generate steam to create energy. Um, and Iceland does this quite a bit because Iceland is a, it's a volcanic island. And so the um, level to which you have to drill to access the levels of heat, which are viable for energy production are relatively yeah. close to the surface. So it's pretty cheap. Um, I'm not really too familiar with um, how that would play out in Vermont, how far down we'd have to drill. But again, if essentially the reason that we're not seeing more creative mixes of energy is because oil companies are allowed to pollute for free. If they weren't allowed to pollute for free, the playing field would be more level and and we'd have different energy mixes because people could now compete, you know? So I, we, ne we might never know what geothermal might mean for Vermont um, if we don't allow for innovation to take place in the energy sector. Uh, my husband just told me to stop making weird faces. <laughs> so I just texted my sister about the geothermal thing because I have this vague rem memory that she told me like uh, fall line and I feel like she said something about a volcano I could just be totally making that up can, does anybody know what I'm talking about can anybody correct me do we know in terms of energy production or carbon output uh the G volcanoes release stuff. a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide oh, wait hold on so wait I said to my sister, could we do geothermal here? And she said, yes, being done in the island. I've heard mixed results. Which, like Grand Isle? Yeah. She oh. looked at Grand Isle. So were they, were they volcanoes? I'm phoning a friend. <laughs> All right, let's see. Do we have any questions? All right. Karen said they tax unemployment too. So we pay tax, we pay a tax called unemployment tax. And then they tax the tax that we pay. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess it's called unemployment insurance technically, but whatever. That is super funny. Um, okay, so so there's this new kind of nuclear. Okay, you, you talked about not all energy companies get a level playing field to compete. Yeah. Right, and some of that is because of what? Like um, well, subsidies, mm -hmm. tax breaks, special carve outs in the law, stuff so like that. So the conservative argument to this would be because global warming the climate changing is gonna cost us money to adapt. And so allowing companies to pollute for free, it's as if we're giving them a subsidy. We're subsidizing their ability to pollute by making it free. This gives them tremendous amounts of savings and distorts the market because everybody's saying, well, climate action is impossible because the market has determined that fossil fuels are the cheapest and most efficient source of energy when this just isn't true because we aren't taking into account the externalized costs, the externality, that is pollution. If companies were forced to pay for their pollution, the playing field would be more level because, um, you know, um, oh my goodness gracious, nuclear and solar and wind and hydro who don't have that carbon footprint in their energy output could then compete because now everybody is paying for their externalized costs. Um, no costs are being left out. And so that level playing field would send a price signal to the economy saying, hey, pollution is no longer a way to justify to your shareholders that I'm saving this company money by stoking the atmosphere full of CO2. And it would actually incentivize investors 
to pour their money into green energy sources, which is why we could answer some of these questions, right? What would fusion look like for the United States? What would geothermal look like for Vermont? It would encourage investment in green sources of energy, which would provide answers to these questions that we don't yet have. And so- fossil, So hold on. Yeah, fossil fuels hold are really cheap is all I'm trying to say. Well, and so this is my question. Mm -hmm. And this is, and so this is where, this is where we got to dance a little bit and figure out what this means, right? So when I hear you say that, mm -hmm. conservative, right? Because uh, I'm a conservative. Right. I hear you say that and I think level playing field, you know, isn't the government going to be required to create some kind of a mechanism that enforces or has some kind of a, my concern is, does that shrink the government or does that make it bigger? It actually shrinks the government. Thank you. My, my concern. Yeah. It actually shrinks the government. Um, so this is federal policy. Um, so carbon dividends is essentially a carbon fee, right? We generate revenue from the carbon fee. And as a conservative, I'm concerned about where this money is going. Because if it's going to fuel the federal bureaucracy, I'm not about it. But it's going to be in the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act HR 763, you should look it up. All that money is going to be recycled right back into the economy and given to taxpayers through the form of a quarterly dividend to help us transition into a renewables-based economy. So this prevents two things. It prevents it going from the to the federal bureaucracy, and it also prevents the carbon price from becoming regressive because companies can't pass those costs on to us. Um, because we have the so then how, okay, well then how then do you make sure that that money is going towards realistic, thoughtful projects and research and development? Because we well, heard about, what was it when um, that you hear, it's the scandal that they bring up all the time for the Obama administration about some solar company that mm -hmm. under or something, like all these companies got a whole bunch of federal money and mm -hmm. then just immediately went bankrupt. Well, it wouldn't, so no companies are going to get any federal money. This would, so this would shrink the government because under carbon, under the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, all okay. subsidies for all fuels would be null and void. Everything just goes away. Any, yep. And any EPA regulation, like the Clean Power Plan under the Obama administration that tries to reduce emissions um, would also be null and void. So we could okay. price emissions and reduce um, we could price emissions and reduce pollution while also shrinking the government because now all these EPA stipulations about greenhouse gases would be null and void and any energy subsidies would also be null and void. Okay, wait, hold on. So I must be missing something. But so if we're, if we're, if we've created, if we've said that there's, okay, I'm missing something. If we've said that we're going to, we're gonna say that there's a cost to polluting. Yep. And the companies that pollute are gonna pay it. Mm -hmm. And then we collect that, do we, we collect that money? Yep, and we use existing streams of revenue collection through the IRS because it wouldn't be exactly. based on the amount, it, it wouldn't be taxed at the gas pump or when you buy something. That's not where the, it's very far upstream. And it's based on the amount of the amount of emissions that would be emitted if you combusted this um, fossil fuel. So like when okay. a barrel of oil enters the, like, let's say we have a barrel of oil from Montana, right? Yeah. The first transaction that happens with that barrel of oil, that's where the carbon tax is applied. Well, that's where the carbon mm -hmm. price is applied. It's not applied at the smokestack. It's not applied at the oil well or at the gas pump. It's applied at the first transaction that uh, that, that barrel of oil undergoes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I know and so, that, but then we're going to use the money for research and development. Nope. All the money that is generated from the carbon tax is going to be returned to the citizens in the form of a quarterly dividend. And so, okay. I totally or, missed. That's what I missed. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's why it's called the carbon dividend. Um, Hold on a second. Wait yeah. a second. Okay. You just blew my mind. Yeah. So this is a real bill that's in in Congress right now? It's a revenue neutral carbon tax. And it's a, it basically, do you mind if I, I don't want to hijack the conversation. No. So there's four pillars to the carbon tax. One, there's the carbon fee, which we discussed. 
all the revenue generated from that carbon fee is returned to the citizens, you and I, through the form of a quarterly dividend, right? Okay. The and regulatory based on income. Nope, it's equitable for across revenue. the board. Yeah, across the board. Okay. There's a regulatory simplification because all energy subsidies, including EPA regulations on greenhouse gases, would be eliminated. Unwound. Okay. And there's also a border carbon adjustment. So it doesn't matter if the United States does, you know, the most incredible, you know, acrobatic emissions reduction scheme of all time, if other world polluters, namely China and India, don't follow suit. And so the border carbon adjustment allows us to collect a carbon tax on imported goods from China and India based on the amount of emissions that took place in their production. And rather than let us collect a carbon tax on their imported good, they're going to start collecting a carbon tax in their own countries, um, at which point you will we'll start pricing carbon for them. But through one piece of federal legisla legislation, the United States can use its position as world consumers to influence global emissions. So it would actually reduce global emissions without the need for bulky or unfair treaties like the Paris Accords. So you can agree with President Trump's decision to pull us out of the Paris Accords, but still want alternative means to reduce emissions. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like, um, just for any viewers who might be getting bored, um, if you'd like more information, if you go to the climateleadershipcouncil.org, uh, clc.org, they have a lot of information on the carbon dividend. Well. well, and that was the main, I mean, there were a lot of um, criticisms of the Paris Climate Accord, yeah. heard. Uh, a lot of, you know, I know a lot of people were excited about it, but the one thing that I heard that was the most troubling for me was that it gave some kind of regulatory power to people outside of the United States. Yep. So I was like, I'm not, I didn't elect those people. No. I don't know who they are. Why would I allow them to make laws in my country when they don't? No. This... I thought that was really weird. It's true. We make ourselves incredibly vulnerable when we give ourselves up to foreign unelected power, which is contrary to the carbon dividend, which puts America in the driver's seat because we are dictating to all other world polluters, most of whom are our foreign policy adversaries, that it's time for them to bone up and get a similar carbon pricing scheme going. Um, and it puts America in the driver's seat. And it also protects American industry because if America is the only one pricing carbon, it's that issue of scale that we talked about with Vermont. Businesses could flee to other countries where they could pollute for free and emissions would stay the same. But the border and, carbon adjustment prevents that sort of thing from happening. And I, I say that all the time. It's This is another one of the things that I hear conservatives say all the time. And so I just want, this. Is, I'm bringing it up because I think it's funny as a conservative when I hear conservatives give really bad arguments. And then everybody like, oh, we reduced all of our emissions so much over this period of time and America is so great. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. But some of that is because we've obfuscated our manufacturing to yeah. countries where they don't have labor laws, where they don't have the EPA making rules, you know, so China can pollute all they want and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It's um, true. We haven't reduced emissions. We've offshored them. <laughs> so I know like for sure we've definitely reduced absolutely I don't want to say that we've done nothing here right when you look at what is required as an example like the toxic chemicals and the waste from making cell phones I think if if we made these things here in the United States the people who are concerned about the environment, I think would probably have other things they would be focusing on. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to be like that about it, but like we, we have to be responsible, not only for the direct pollution that we cause, right? Like right. if I'm burning trash in my backyard or doing something like that, but what is my consumption as well? Mm -hmm. Am I producing the things that I'm using? Are we looking for alternatives in our manufacturing for making laptops? I'm not, I'm a hypocrite, right? I've got a laptop right here. I've got a cell phone. Yep. Um, so that's, that's interesting that there's this possibility that we could 
help influence overseas without it being terrible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I wholeheartedly agree. And it doesn't violate any international trade agreements because we aren't singling out China's goods for being Chinese. We're singling them out for their emissions, which would then be, and, and then that carbon price would be redacted if they showed signs of reducing emissions themselves. And so it's not arbitrary why we would price goods from China and India. It has everything right. to do with emissions and nothing to do with nationality. And so it's not protectionism and it's not a tariff. And so it doesn't violate those international trade agreements. So then, this is so fascinating. What is the name of the bill again? So it's the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which is HR 763. HR 762? Um, 63. Um, but then if you go on the citizens, um, or sorry, the Climate Leadership Council.org has a lot of great literature on the subject. And it's, uh, it's actually, the policy wasn't developed by politicians. It was developed by a policy entrepreneur named Ted Halstead, who started the okay. um, Climate Leadership Council. Um, and it was actually, so this bill for carbon dividends in general was actually designed by James Baker and uh, George Schultz, both of whom were Reagan economists who were economic advisors to Ronald Reagan. Another Republican president. Yep. I think, isn't it fascinating that the way we've been talking and all of these initiatives and, and things for the forests and the, all Republican presidents. Yep. So why does Obama get so much shine for the Paris Climate Accord or whatever when Republican presidents in the past have actually done all this amazing stuff? You know, that's a really interesting question. I can tell you one of the things that needs to change real quickly is we're quickly becoming the party of anti and not the party of what are we going to do about it. So I can say we're anti Paris Accords, we're anti government spending, we're anti big government, we're anti tax. But, like, okay, there's a positive to each one of these antis that, for lack of a better term, that we don't do a good job of explaining. So, for example, I personally am against the Paris Climate Accords. I think pulling us out was a good decision. Most Republicans are pretty good at expressing that sentiment, but they have no yes and. Like, what, what are we going to do? We've what got else? Yes. Clearly from the conversation that we've just had, um, you know, the carbon dividend is nothing but like bedrock conservative economics that's been, that there's precedent for. This is happened, like we've used market-based um, policies to reduce emissions before, but yeah. we just can't seem to explain it or get our message out. And so that's why <laughs> it's so important to have these conversations. I, um... Let's see, Trevor and Mike are talking about our gas tax. Trevor just said, as far as I know, our gas tax is at least 32 cents a gallon. Right. And so the gas tax, see, this is the fundamental difference between the carbon dividend policy, which we've been chatting about, and a yeah. gas tax. A gas tax is meant to influence consumer behavior. You need to go buy a, an emissions-free automobile, an emissions-free form of transportation, or drive less. Okay as if global warming is your fault and personal choice is the only thing causing emissions. Carbon yes. dividends is meant to influence the habits of producers. You need to produce means of electricity that do not emit. And so oh. it's not about punishing consumers into making different choices. It's about allowing the producers of our society to innovate and-, and Okay, for us. that was super well articulated, sounds, it sounds very sexy, okay? It sounds, the economist in me was like, wow, that was great, okay? Mm -hmm. it, doesn't it, my only concern is that it still will end up on the consumer in the end. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, because if we, if they, if they pay a dividend or whatever. We get a dividend. We get a dividend. If they pay to pollute, then, and if they have to figure out ways to not pollute and whatever, isn't that still going to drive up the cost, which invariably we will end up paying in the end? So that's a great question. And before I answer it, if anyone wants, or if you'd like any concrete answers before I just give my verbal answer, um, 
James Baker and George Schultz, the two Reagan economists who um, devised this bill. Yeah. And as along with um, Nobel laureate candidate, oh my goodness, I can't remember his name, but he wrote my economics textbook, um, modeled what carbon dividends would mean for the US. And we could actually exceed our commitments to the Paris Accords in a shorter amount of time while growing our GDP. Um, their models indicate actually a net growth to our GDP um, through the expansion of our energy sector, which isn't expanding right now because the market's been distorted. Because it's so, stuck. So our GDP would actually grow and we would exceed our commitments to the Paris Accords without having to commit to this. See, and it's again, market solution creates a better outcome. Yep. And so you can see all that data there for yourself if you don't believe me on clc.org. But in answer to your question, uh, yeah there would be in the first couple months of the carbon tax, a transitional period where people would use their dividend to acquire the same fuel that they've always had. But what is unavoidable, what I mentioned earlier, is the price signal that would be sent to investors throughout the country showing that, you know, the fact that these companies pollute is what will end up sinking them. And so it's time to find alternative means mm. of transportation. And so once those come about, once again, answers to questions that we don't even understand yet, people will make different choices. You know, rational people as we are, we like to save money. And if we <laughs> equate saving money to reducing emissions, then yep. people try to save money, they'll choose yep. the option that reduces emissions the most. And yep. so whether that's an electric car, a hybrid vehicle, hydrogen fuel cell, which is something that's on the horizon. Um, Ford has a deal with uh, Standard Hydrogen, which is a company out of Ithaca um, cool. for hydrogen cars. Um, also, you should check out some of the corporate sponsors of this bill. Um, it's sponsored by Ford, Shell, BP, oil is on board with it. It's one of the only policies that has attracted major corporations, but also the World Wildlife Foundation and the Nature <clears throat> That is, wait, hold on. I'm sorry. Hold on. Back. You need to say that again. Did you just say this bill has the approval of a, of a forestry <laughs> service and an oil company? Yep. If you go on... Um, climateleadershipcouncil.org. You'll see they're sponsored by Ford. They're sponsored by General Electric. They're sponsored by Shell and British Petroleum, but also the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Federation. And the reason for that is companies want price certainty because with regulations, EPA um, bureaucrats can change those rather arbitrarily. And depending on who the president is, there might either be more regulations or none. And companies want price certainty. They want a schedule of when their prices are going to Security. Gonna and yep. so... That's, that's what attracts them to this bill. And a lot of lefties like to point at it and say that it's because it wouldn't reduce emissions. And that's not true. Look at the numbers. Wow. Okay. We're talking about, in the, in the chat, they're talking about electric cars being mm -hmm. ridiculously expensive. A new battery costs $600 and is hyper, hyper toxic. Well, uh, why would you invest in it when everybody is driving gas-powered cars? It, it attracts so few dollars for R&D that it's not surprising. And the government has tried to pick up some slack with subsidies, but that could never compare to the power given by private investment. Well, and not only that, it's another a thousand pound battery. Oh, I think I posted that the other day. Um, which if it's if it weighs that much, how much more energy does it take to push it? Plus electric cars have to be powered by something. What's yeah. the electricity made out of? <laughs> It's another wealth transfer from the poor to the rich, in my opinion. You know, it's like the only people who can afford them are rich people or well off. And if our unemployment <coughs> whoops, and social security and stuff are being taxed, then that's what's paying for it. And, yeah. it's, you know, we when we say that we're for the poor and the little people and you know, make the rich pay their fair share. Why are we taking from the le less people with less and giving it to people with more? Excuse me while I go on the other side of my camera and fix my light. Oh, it's no problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a really common theme. I mean, obviously, with all due respect to um, Vermont Democrats and, gen and Democrats in general, I think that there's a disconnect between what voters envision as the result of their proposed policies and the yeah. actual result. And so this whole conversation has been around the fallacy of state level emissions reductions um, versus the 
true benefits of federal level emissions reductions. And so I think that there's really just a disconnect between what people envision their legislators are doing and the actual result, which you've articulated. Yep. And that's what, um, my big thing that I've asked about is why are we going back and checking and making sure that these programs are working? Yeah. You know, we sink all this money, we create all this legislation, we say, we're going to put money here, we're going to put money there. But we're not measuring. It doesn't seem like things are being measured. It just seems like they're adding more money on top of an already inefficient system. Yeah. And for a lot of, there is no reliable metric to measure success, which is why these are so dangerous. I mean, it's oh. a lot of government programs are kind of like a money pit because you could just pour infinite amount, infinite amounts of money into it like like climate initiatives or things along that uh, along the along those lines but um there's just no real reliable metric to measure success and that's one of the biggest problems that as conservative i have with the government being the tool to solve some of these problems right this is what i'm yeah. saying the government is terrible at everything i mean it really is i name a thing that the government has put its grubby little hands in that it made it better yeah. And so again, yeah, as we were just discussing, carbon dividends would actually reduce government and lower emissions. It's, it's absolutely possible. Let me see. Okay. Colleen says, how is an electric car going to run in the Northeast Kingdom winter with a week of negative 20? The closest charging station to me is 24 miles. Yeah. And so the idea that, that you know, arbitrarily choosing electric cars as the future of transportation will, will lead to results like that. Um, but, so it might work in like Texas yeah. or Virginia or somewhere that has a more temperate climate, mm -hmm. but here necessarily. Right. And so that's why it's so important to let the market determine our energy mix, essentially let us determine what works best for us. Because as I mentioned earlier, there's all sorts of technologies which aren't that well known because of lack of investment, like hydrogen fuel cells, which are sustainable, uh, which function very similar to the cars that we have now, except they use hydrogen fuel as the mode of combustion rather than um, gasoline. Um, that would work incredibly well in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, and we'll have a lot of really interesting answers to these questions if we could just unleash the power of American innovation and ingenuity on, on climate change. Oh my gosh. What? You mean solve our problems? The that we always have whenever we've encountered anything that we couldn't figure out or needed to fix. Um, that's what the, that's one of the things that I found is, is funny about the conversation is we've always found a way. Human beings have always found a way, not just Americans, right? But human beings have gone through, you know, ice ages and thaws and the everything right we've been through this I, we used to be on one continent together right so clearly we've been able to adapt and figure it out yeah uh, why don't we think why don't people think we can do that now so the system that is most amenable to that mode of thinking being that there's an answer to every question and that given the right incentives, we can figure it out and then we'd be guided by an invisible hand to help others. That's the basics of free market economies. And as, and because in, in a free market, who knows how far it'll go, but also in a free market, you know, there, there's the possibility that, um, you know, those who have a, a hard time contributing to society, those who, who don't have a job, they struggle. And we as a society can can obviously come together to help those people because nobody deserves to live out in the cold. But what's so attractive about socialism is that there's a plan for everybody. The government has a plan for everybody, but in that plan, they've limited how far you can go. Yeah. And so the reason that social um, democracies, that being like those of Western um, or Eastern Europe, sorry, could never really solve climate change is because the government could never plan far enough into the future to account for the revolutionary solutions that would reduce emissions. Oh my God. 
the free market allows for all those possibilities to come to fruition. And so it's not about savage competition that's, you know, funnels all the money to the top echelon, you know, the bourgeoisie and keeps everybody else down. It's about allowing a space to create itself for those who wish to create. That's, I think that <clears throat> moving away from a meritocracy and meritocracy sounds like bad, I think a lot of times because not everyone has the same skills, not everyone has the same abilities and things like that. And, and so we want people to be like you, like you said a moment ago, we want everyone to be taken care of. Yeah. We don't want to get in the way of the people who can really excel. You know, the Benjamin Franklins who invented 40 million things, the Nikola Tesla, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, Alexander Graham Bell. Yeah. If we stifle, if we had been in a place where that kind of innovation where that creativity was being stifled and stuffed, where would we be today? Yeah, I mean, I, there's there's no telling. And people focus on the free market, again, like as if it's this machine that displaces wealth away from people and and this meritocracy is, you know, sort of fake and look at all these people who are suffering. That's, that's, that's just absolutely not what it's about at all. And you hit the nail right on the head. Um, and additionally, if I could just speak to that, point for, for just one second. One of the yeah. things that bothers me a lot about um, a lot of my Democrat colleagues is this idea that conservatives aren't compassionate because we don't see government as the tool to solve poverty. Um, we the people, like we as society, will pick up the slack where government leaves off. So I may not think that some disinterested bureaucrat is the best tool for alleviating poverty or digging someone out of the situation. I would like to pick up the slide with the charity work that, you know, we could do on the weekend. Like, you know, so there's, yeah, it's about creating a space where you could manifest your best self into the world. It's not about, you know, having a life that's already planned out and an equal outcome for everybody. It's just not how you bring about prosperity. Yep. I, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. It completely uh, agree. Okay. So it's seven fifty nine. We're getting close to the end. Uh, Ray just said one more thing. So I know I said we were going to end at eight, but I want your opinion on this next. He of course. Because I've heard of this and I don't know how feasible it actually is. Uh, Ray said another idea would be burning our waste to generate energy. I've heard that that's a thing, that there's like something that burns it and it recycles and doesn't. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I've heard. I've heard of that. I mean, all organic, the reason that combusting fossil fuels produces energy is because between all the bonds between carbon and carbon, there's energy in those bonds. And so all organic matter possesses some kind of energy in the bonds between itself. And so, I mean, okay. our waste is organic energy. And so I would have to imagine that there'd be some energy in that waste. I would ask the question, what kinds of things are emitted from um, using that waste as fuel? Um, but I mean, who knows? I'm, I'm not super familiar with that, but that's a really interesting thing. That is so, and we're getting a science lesson here today, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, too. A science lesson okay. from Republicans. Yes! Oh, wait! Republicans believe in science? Yeah, who knew? What? Yeah. I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Karen said they burn trash in Europe, or that's, they do something like that in Europe. Yeah, I know they do that in Singapore too because they have a finite space, um, finite political boundary and they can't offshore their trash. Um, and I've heard that that becomes energy as well. I don't know a ton about that process, but again, like, who knows? I look mean, at, look, could be something look at solutions. Mm -hmm. Yes. What, you know, consider anything. Yeah, a diverse energy portfolio is bad for no one. It, thank you. Uh, Trevor said they tried that in Ticonderoga with the tire plant. Vermont shot it down even with about 60% of Vermont as the contributing factor. Vermont does not like big business. That is true. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's why Forbes ranked us 45th out of 50 states for business friendly practices. I mean, 49th out of 50ness, 50 for business unfriendliness. Mm -hmm. That is like, if people don't know why we don't have good jobs here 
if people don't understand why we can't pay for stuff mm -hmm. because the taxes and regulations are so I, I I we're talking about the environment but I was talking to an economist re, uh, a while ago and he said it's like it's something like a hundred thousand dollars in fees before you for a for a five unit apartment building right hundred thousand dollars in fees and environmental studies and stuff before you've even drawn a picture or put a shovel in the ground. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what our land use laws have done. Um, and so that's, that's the other thing. Like, Actually. Yeah. Let's wrap, let's wrap up with this. Let's take a couple minutes and just talk, just say a little bit about the act 250 land use laws in Vermont. I think people, I think that they had a point at one time. Mm -hmm. I think, they have done some good. It's kept Vermont beautiful, right? We talked about earlier in the century how all our trees were cut down and we had no wildlife and all that stuff, right? We've got to restore those things. What now, though, when the cost is so great to keep them in place? Yeah. Um, so, you know, as an environmental policy guy, I'm, I'm very concerned about sustainability. And sustainability goes both ways. You know, if something is environmentally unsustainable, it's dangerous. And if something is economically unsustainable, it's also dangerous. And so if land use laws are preventing all development all the time and making it incredibly expensive to even break ground to the point where it just doesn't make sense for a business, which is not, you know, a philanthropy organization um, to go somewhere else, we, we just have to find a way to preserve Vermont and Vermonters. Because as I said before, um, you know, if everybody flees, right, we're one of the states with a declining population, there's not gonna be any money for any of these environmental protection regulations to be enforced. There's not gonna be any revenue generated from the tax on hunting and fishing goods to conserve these animal species. And so nobody wants, you know, urban sprawl to overtake the entire state, but we have to find a way to keep businesses coming to Vermont, but also, you know, and I think that Vermont's really in an interesting spot because one of our most lucrative um, sectors of business is ecotourism. And so in order to have a thriving ecotourism industry, we need the eco, but we also need the tourism. And I know that's <laughs> very cool, but there's gotta be a way to allow these ecotourism businesses to flourish because they depend on people to, you know, work the concession stands, to work the ski lifts, um, you know, to be ski instructors, but there also has to be the mountain to ski on. And so it's a, yes. it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You really need them both. And I think that, you know, I don't have all the answers, obviously, but, you know, if elected, I would obviously pursue solutions that preserve Vermont and Vermont. Yes. Yes. Okay. So tell everybody that was a perfect place to stop. Awesome. I love it. So tell everybody where to go. Um, oh, and okay. Hold on. So everybody, there's a meet and greet at Bucky's in Hinesburg this weekend. I was told not to forget to tell everybody. So from three to five at Bucky's in Hinesburg this weekend, we're doing an in-person meet and greet. It's outside, socially distanced. Come and visit us. Um, ben, tell everyone where they can find you on social media, your website, and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I've got a Mutolo is a M-U-T-O-L-O. I've got Mutolo for statehouse.com. Um, I've got Instagram, website. It's all Mutolo for statehouse. Uh, and if you live in Jericho and Underhill, I, I hope I could uh, get your vote for November 3rd. I hope that you win because you are exactly the kind of person that I want to see in my legislature. Um, I'm sure that if we talked long enough, we would find some things that we disagree on. Sure. You would find some uh, maybe <clears throat> different values. Right. But I love how you, it's, it's, it's clear that you've thought very deeply about these topics. It's very clear that you care and are passionate about it. And that's the kind of people that we need. You know, they don't have to be people that have all the answers, but they have to be people who are willing to find them. Absolutely. I and love that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, yeah. I, I really had a ball chatting with you and good, best of luck in your election as well. I'm rooting for you. Yeah. Not thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, everybody, you can find me at ericareddick.com uh, on here, Facebook, same on Instagram. It's generally irritable. 
and you can donate. Do you have a donation link on your website? Mm -hmm. Everybody, the maximum donation is $1,560. So, you know, holler at your people. Um, but really any amount is great. Any amount is helpful. It is hard to run a campaign in Vermont as a conservative. So we, I know for, for me, a lot of the money that I'm receiving is going towards advertisements uh, to make sure that we get the word out. So anything that you can do is super helpful. Ben, thank you again so much for coming. Everyone, thank you for visiting and for your questions. Love it. Uh, throw us, throw some suggestions in the comment section about what you'd like to hear people talk about next week. And uh, we'll get something on the schedule. We'll be back next week at seven o'clock live again. All right. Thanks so much. Bye, Ben. Bye-bye.